Welcome into Discern. It is Christmas Eve, December 24th. We are so privileged to have Jim Dennison with us here once again. Hello, Jim. Hey, Ross. Good to be with you today, my friend. How are you? I am great. Very excited about Christmas tomorrow and really excited to just have this opportunity to chat with you a little bit again about Christmas. We've hit a few topics around that when we've been visiting uh, this week and in, in December. But today I want to take a little bit of a detour um, and not jump into a specific headline, but just kind of talk to you about something that I've observed and maybe a conversation that might happen around the holiday uh, with our friends that we gather. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be having lunch today with friends um, that some are believers, some aren't, to be honest. And so there's going to be some conversation opportunities. And in, and in particular, rather than read a news headline, Jim, one of the things that, that I've found, you know, C.S. Lewis put forth this concept that you have to do something with Jesus. And so he used this concept of you either make him your Lord, you call him a liar, or you say he's a lunatic. Now, there's a fourth one that has developed over time uh, since C.S. Lewis said that, which is legend. So you've got these four L's and the fourth is legend. And in my lifetime, most people who don't embrace Jesus as their Lord say, interesting guy, kind of a fantastical legend, probably been embellished over the years. And we've kind of put him up in this place that's not realistic. And one of those areas that they seem to point to is this nativity, this coming as a baby. It feels almost like caricatures. I see the statues. I see the grandeur around, you know, this picturesque stable scene. Can you just kind of help set the scene here, Jim? Jesus as a baby, it seems outlandish, but why is that so significant? And I can understand that, why people would think that, because so much of what we think about Christmas really does feel like legend, when actually the actual birth of Jesus happened exactly as it would have in that cave in that grotto back 20 centuries ago. But really the other part of Christmas, that on Christmas Eve it's great to think about, is the why behind it. The why is, as Irenaeus put it, God became one of us so we could be one with him. It's because we, you and I, are sinful people. We can't get access to a sinless, perfect, holy God. I can't work my way up to heaven any more than I can walk into a sterile hospital room unless I'm garbed and I'm sterile. If I bring any germs into the room, I contaminate the room. If I bring my sins into God's perfect paradise, it's no longer perfect. So I can't get there. No amount of religion can do it. No amount of legendary religious um, kind of observances or traditions can get me there. I can't get up to God. I can't climb high enough to get to God. I can't swim to Hawaii. Even if I'm an Olympic swimmer, I can't swim to Hawaii. I can't get there. And so God came to me because I couldn't come to him. God came to me as a baby to demonstrate that if he would be born in that nativity, he'll be born in my heart. If he'd be born in that feed trough, he'll be born in my life and in your life. He grew up from a baby to become a young boy, to become a man, because as the Bible said, he was tempted in every manner of sin like as we are. He can understand our temptation because he's faced our temptation. Had he come to earth at 33 years of age to die on the cross, he wouldn't have faced all the temptations of humanity. But because he came as a baby and came to full life, he experienced all of our life and therefore that temptation. He spent three years in public ministry to demonstrate if he would meet their needs, he'll meet our needs. If he would heal their bodies, he can heal our bodies. If he would forgive their sin, he can forgive our sin. He died on the cross, the most horrific manner of death ever devised, to demonstrate that he feels our pain. There's no pain we can feel he hasn't feel. There's no need we can have he can't meet. There's no temptation we can face that he hasn't faced. And then ultimately he died to pay for our sin so he could forgive us and bring us to eternal life. There is no sin he won't forgive. All of that is the incarnation. All of that is the miracle that starts at Christmas. Jim, the nativity scene itself has kind of become an object of scrutiny. You know, a lot of people are, I think, in some ways put off or confused by it or like, okay, that didn't really, it didn't happen like that, did it? And so they kind of would say, well, this again contributes to that legend. Can you speak to the, the reality of those pictures and those images? Absolutely. Yeah, there really is a history to all of that. If you're thinking about nativities as we think about them, you actually have St. Francis of Assisi to thank. He was actually the person back in the 13th century that started making nativities a thing as we understand them and think about them now. The three wise men actually weren't three. They gave three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but they probably traveled in groups of 12 or so. They weren't there actually the night of Jesus' birth. According to Matthew 2, they came to the house as the text says, not to the manger. They found a child, which is a different Greek word from a baby. Herod killed all the babies two years old and under 
according to the time he learned from the Magi. So they saw the star at the night of Jesus' birth, but it took as much as two years for them to actually come and present their gifts to the child at the house, not to the infant in the cave in the actual nativity as we think of it. So the wise men actually weren't there as we think of it. It was actually a cave, not the stable, that most of us have on our mantles as we think of them at home. And it wasn't the nativity as we think of it. That's more something that St. Francis brought forward. But while none of that is actually what happened historically, there's a beautiful symbolic truth behind all of that that the Magi represent all of us, that the Gentiles are welcome, not just the Jews, that people from Persia, actually Iranians today, were welcome to celebrate this child that came for us, that if shepherds are invited, we are invited, and if Jesus would come into a cave, he'd come into my heart. So we can separate the history and the symbolism of it, but let's understand that what's behind all that symbolism is the fact that God became man. Yeah, and the fact that God became man is the exact critical message of Christmas, I do feel like a lot of times the grandeur of the holiday and the sometimes the, the productions and the plays and all these things sometimes can take people down a path of, okay, that seems too fantastical to have been real. And of course, that's not the intention, of course, of churches that put on dramatic uh, Christmas pageants. In fact, in the churches I've pastored, we've done that as well. A lot of them have an evangelistic purpose. People can get uh, non-Christians to come with them to Christmas Eve pageants or to Christmas pageants when they might not typically come to church. And then they can hear about the gospel and no faith, uh, no Jesus as Lord. There's a pageant put on by a church in my area here in Dallas that has hundreds of professions of faith every year, specifically as a result of their Christmas pageants. And so they certainly can have an evangelist purpose. They're certainly designed to honor Jesus, to glorify Jesus. They don't. They certainly don't intend to communicate that this is how it actually happened 20 centuries ago. But it's good to come along and make those separations so we understand the reality of Christmas, so that reality can be a reality for us on this Christmas Eve as well. And I'll say even me growing up, those uh, pageants and those experiences were pretty influential in my appreciation and understanding of what Christ did. I personally never struggled with the, gosh, is this is this a fantastical representation? Um, for me, it was always a blessing, and I think it continues to be. And a lot of these, uh, I mean, this, the heart behind these is, is clear, and they absolutely still make an impact. There are times that I think some people just get distracted or confused about the actual reality of it. And that's what we want people to understand, and not just about Christmas. The same is true of Easter. The same is true, really, of Jesus' life and ministry. There's reality here. There's fact here. If you'll give me Tacitus, Suetonius, Marabar, Serapi, and Pliny the Younger, Josephus, I don't even have to open a New Testament to demonstrate the facts that Jesus was born in what we call Christmas, that he grew up in what we think of as Palestine, that he died on a cross, that his believers knew him to be raised from the dead and worshipped him as God. Those are facts of history. And the good news is those can be facts in our lives as well. And one thing we can always encourage uh, people to do if they really want to understand this, the history is read the text. You know, a lot of times, instead of trying to see the interpretation or the the symbolic representation or the ways that we're trying to convey the message in today's world and today's culture, go back and read what scripture says. You know, it doesn't say there was three wise men. If you're hung up on that, go read the text. You know, that's something, it's a good opportunity to kind of point people back to the true essence of Christmas. Uh, and, and I think that's a good opportunity at, at Christmas to engage in these conversations. I agree. And to make sure we read the story itself, go back and actually read the word of God. J.I. Packer said the Bible is God preaching. So let's spend some time in the word listening to God preach to us. St. Augustine said the Bible is love letters from home. Your father has written you a love letter. No better time of the year to open that letter than Christmas Eve. And as we close, I think, you know, it's just a good reminder again it has almost become a cliche that Jesus is the reason for the season. But just for our audience, just to remember, it really is the case. And so, I mean, so much of, of what we're doing on this show is just trying to help contextualize culture and what's going on around us. And I know it's Christmas Eve. There's going to be a ton of excitement. There may be some struggles with family in town, all these sorts of things. But I, I would urge our audience, and it's a, a reminder for myself, Put Jesus at the center of this celebration and remember that he came to overcome. That is that is what Christmas is about. That's right. We say Jesus is the reason for the season, and that's true. Another way to say it is you're the reason for the season. You're the reason he came. If you were the only person that ever lived, he'd have done it all again just for you. That's how much Jesus loves you. 
And that's the incredible story of Christmas. Thanks, Jim. So encouraging. I wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. I wish the same for our audience. Christmas is tomorrow. We'll see everybody right back here Monday on Discern.